So our next speaker is Rick O'Connor. He's already there. Um, he has many years of experience um, on the executive level in management and semiconductor companies. He was the executive director of RISC-5 uh, from 2015 to 2018, correct? I forgot. <laughs> yeah, before. And he is the founder, president, and CEO of the Open Hardware Group nowadays. So thank you, Rick. So what's the secret with the, uh, the clicker? Which one? Next. Next, I see. The one, that, the one that's labeled next. All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How many of you, this is your very first RISC-5 event? Oh, that's cool, about a third. That's cool. Um, how many of you have actually read the spec? That's a good number. Smaller number of hands, though. That's a good read. So my name is Rick O'Connor. I'm the CEO of the Open Hardware Group. And as, there we go. Um, as, uh, as we were just talking about, uh, I, I spent some time with the RISC-V Foundation uh, at the very beginning. It's a pleasure to be back here in Barcelona. I think we held one of our first workshops in Europe in Barcelona many, many years ago. Um, and then a workshop at ETH Zurich back in 2019. I'm going to give a quick history of the open hardware ecosystem, what it's about and what we do, to then go into some lessons that we've learned over the last three years. So, in fact, almost four years ago today, we were uh, on campus at ETH Zurich, hosted by uh, Luca Benini and Franco Kenyak, for uh, a RISC-V workshop. And at that event, we announced the formation of the open hardware ecosystem, or at least uh, the intent, because we didn't, we didn't have anything yet. We didn't have any agreements, we didn't have anything. And the catalyst was uh, large volume SOC semiconductor guys wanted open source implementations written in system Verilog that worked in today's commercial EDA tools. There's lots of good innovation going on with EDA tools and CAD tools and so on, and that's great. But for these high volume SOC guys to get to production now, they didn't want to have to reinvent their CAD and EDA system, right? They wanted to be able to take the languages they use and trust, System Verilog, and the tools they know and work on some implementations. And it turns out that the good team at, at ETH Zurich, the platform guys, we're always developing in System Verilog. So there was a couple of cores that were contributed, the RISCI core, many of you know what that core is about, um, and the Ariane core. So RISCI is an embedded class four-stage core. Ariane is a 64-bit Linux-capable six-stage application class core. And the idea was to form, see if we could form a community around supporting those cores in open source, completing the verification work. They came out of academia, after all. So competing, completing the verification work and extending the roadmap. So that was the genesis. We started with, they're called sponsors because there was nothing, no membership agreements to sign yet. We started with about 13 companies who thought this might be a good idea, actually came to me and asked me to do it, um, and launched this organization or launched the intention of the organization. We spent the rest of the year um, refining the, the governance infrastructure, the the licensing rules, how, what, it, what, how does it, um, what does it mean to participate in an open hardware collaborative development environment? And, you know, came up with this sort of a description of what the organization does. But fundamentally, we have a roadmap of system Verilog cores that are verified for use in high volume production SOCs. And that's what the community works on. So fast forward, and we went from 13 to 104 uh, member companies uh, partners and, and academic institutions. You should think of this infrastructure of roughly 400 to 500 development engineers around the world collaborating on open source uh, GitHub uh, repos that contain the system Verilog for the cores, the software tools to run the cores, the verification infrastructure to verify the cores, and put them in your SOCs for high volume production. So I'll click through these, all these nice logos. They're very nice. We're very proud of all of the contributing companies and academic institutions as well as our partners. And just get, leave you with the fact that, you know, like most organizations, we're structured with technical working group, um, marketing working group, and then task groups underneath those working groups to drive the various projects. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. 
But we went from basically one project around the RISCI core, because we started initially we were just working on the RISCI core before we uh, got working on the Ariane CVA6 core. Um, and now there are more than 20 after active projects with, like I said, um, depending on how you count, uh, somewhere between four to 500 engineers around the world collaborating on these various 20 some odd projects. So what that looks like is these two cores that came out of ETH Zurich. Um, as I said, originally they were simply uh, you know, one implementation of, of the uh, RISCI core, one implementation of the Ariane core, um, and created a task group around uh, these two projects led by Silicon Labs and Talus, uh, both of whom were very uh, happy to have their continued support. And from there, developed a roadmap to extend out uh, these cores. We now have nine different cores on the roadmap. There's way too much detail to go through here, but come and visit us in the uh, exhibit floor or uh, you know, just tackle us somewhere in the hall where there's a bunch of open hardware folks running around here all, for all week. Um, if you want to talk about any of these. Uh, if you are in a typical product development company or you're used to having some kind of a stage gate, new product introduction flow to approve a new project, a concept, get that moving, get it through an approval stage, get a schedule, all that stuff. We, have, we try to have something like that, a lightweight version to make it easier just to make sure that these I mean, how hard is it to coordinate your own team inside your own company on a project and the requirements and a common set of goals? Think about doing it across multiple different companies around the world, speak, all speaking different languages, using different tools, and trying to get alignment around that. So we, we, inevitably, you need to have some kind of process in order to help drive this. So let's talk about some stats. Uh, we have more than 50. Uh, there's actually 53, uh, 54 project repos inside the open hardware GitHub account. The, the, um, the, the text says five, 55 because that's where we also manage our open hardware um, .com, or sorry, uh, .org website. So it, it's 55, but there's really 54 project repos. The impressive number, a couple of impressive numbers uh, to take from this. 1,627 forks is a very high ratio of forks to the actual number of repos. And the, what, what you take from that is, we, it's not just us that think this stuff is cool, right? It's, it's the community that thinks this stuff is cool. Whether these forks have been you know, forked one day and just sort of die on the vine and people aren't actually working with them or not, that's a different story, but it's a good number to use as a representation of how attractive is this actually to the end user community. The other thing that, you know, uh, all of these kind of open source projects like to count is the number of stars. We're over 4,000 stars and number of issues. And it's hard to see probably on the, on the slide here, but if come and visit us, we can talk about it. Not surprisingly, the top repos are the original CVA6 repo, the original uh, CVE4, which is the risky core repo, and then the verification test bench that we have in behind those, right? It's a system Verilog, UVM based verification test bench behind the course. So all of that's pretty cool, I think. This is the cool part, great. What about adoption? Well, uh, we don't require anybody to tell us what they're doing uh, and how the cores are being used. I'll let you read the quote, I won't read it to you. Um, I, can I can tell you uh, that variants of the original embedded class core, variants of the risky core, have seen silicon more than 40 times and there are in excess of hundreds of millions of cores in production with, the, with that 32-bit core. So we're very, very proud of that. And on the CVA6 side, led by Talus, um, we're equally proud. That core has seen silicon more than 40 times as well. Uh, I don't have production numbers related to the adoption yet. There's still a bunch of variants, and you can come and talk to us about how much interest the community uh, has shown in this core and different contributions coming from completely independent teams, adding hypervisor support, adding extended um, um, uh, decache support, adding vector accelerator to the core, uh, compliant with the RVV spec. So there's a lot of work going on and uh, you know uh, we could always use more help. So we're very pleased with the support that we get from our 
friends at Talos and at Silicon Labs. And okay, that was the history. Permissive use, absolute requirement. Lesson one is you cannot tell a semiconductor company that they have to grant back. They'll just take their patents and run away and never contribute, right? And there needs to be motivation for a semiconductor company to partici participate in this because it's good for their business, and that's why they'll engage, right? So permissive licensing gives us that. And Apache in particular, and this is just stats from uh, uh, white source software. Um, you, can, you can go to their site and they have a bunch of cool reports. Apache licensing is by far the most popular licensing methodology. And so on top of Apache, uh, we built uh, on top of that, uh, with working with our friends at the Fozzie Foundation, a, uh, around uh, the use of solder pad. And part of it is just to add a few more definitions to on top of the Apache uh, license. And part of, it, part of the way that it works is because every hardware company um, their legal team has digested Apache already for, from some software project. So they get to walk in and say, hey, we want to work in this open source hardware. Yeah, it's a processor core. Yeah, it's kind of like some of the stuff we've done in the past. Uh, yeah, but it's okay because, you know, it's all Apache-based licensing and the, and the legal team gets okay. And if you haven't looked at it yet, uh, go and take a look at the solder pad license and the extra s set of definitions that run on top of it. It's very good work. In our opinion, it is the best hardware-based open source license uh, to use, primarily because it just leverages Apache, and that makes it an easy conversation with the legal team inside hardware companies. And trust me, I've had hundreds. Okay, IP quality. Are you going to be the person that walks, I love this, I do it all the time, I'm going to walk into my boss's office, throw my badge down on the desk and say, hey boss, I'm going to put this core in our next SOC, I got it off a university GitHub repo, it's, it's okay, let's go, right? Probably not. Uh, so, from the get-go, our focus has been around creating trust in the IP with a completely open verification test bench that runs using commercial system Verilog simulators. Um, and leverages uh, open source stimulus to drive the, the device under test. So this, this is a task group that's led by uh, Simon Davidman in Paris and Jean-Jacques Coulon at Talos. And literally it's use the best tool for the job, leverage system Verilog and UVM. That's what SOC integrators know today. This might change and that's okay, but this is how these folks go to production today and make sure that all of the artifacts in the test bench run on existing commercial tools. So this is a uh, where we're going to kind of view of the test bench. Uh, like I said, there's a bunch of open hardware staff here this week. We will have demos in the, uh, in the exhibit space. Come and talk to us about uh, this test bench if, if you have interest. And okay, roadmap and ecosystem. Our software task group. Uh, has been doing uh, great work around enabling all of these cores from an IDE standpoint, o o operating system porting, all, all of the enablement work that you'd expect to see from any IP roadmap. And so there's an Eclipse-based uh, IDE, um, and the teams at Ashling and Embicosm uh, lead this. The, the compiler work is done by Embicosm and the IDE work by Ashling. And we also have a hardware task group, so we build SOCs and FPGA implementations around these cores. Uh, we use uh, digital and FPGA platforms, so the Nexus A7 and Genesis 2. And again, we'll have some of that stuff in our booth. You can come and see that and, and what we're doing there. And we're also talking about uh, an SOC that we're building with a GF. It's in FAB now. Uh, in, in 22FDX called the Core 5 MCU. It's a very simple MCU, um, but with a customization space of embedded FPGA array uh, attached next to the core. And we expect that out in the fall, and we're running a group gets campaign where you can order this board now. So it, this should be up this week and ready for uh, ordering. Um, and it's a pretty cool open source from the gates up uh, implementation of, of all this stuff. 
We also have on the 64-bit side uh, dual-core uh, SMP Linux uh, with an SDK and running open, open Python, and that's on the Genesis platform. Again, I think we'll have that in our booth, so you can come and have a look at that. And that's the three lessons. You gotta make it easy for companies to participate, commercial companies to participate. Commercial adoption is key, obviously, to make open source thrive. I think that goes without saying. The quality has to be there. You can bet your badge uh, on integrating a core into your company's ASIC or SOC. And obviously, all of the right uh, ecosystem and roadmap enablement needs to be there. So that's, that's my talk. Thanks very much. <laughs>